<laughs> All right, everybody. Uh, we're here with two-time Olympic gold medalist, Melissa Seideman. Uh, Melissa, thank you so much for being here with us today. Um, you, you've had a really interesting road uh, over the last uh, 15 or so years. Uh, yeah, you, thank you for having me. <laughs> yeah, thank you for being here. Uh, can you tell us a bit about, uh, about your road thus far and how you kind of got started in the pipeline? When I started with the National, um, the pipeline program was a little bit different. It wasn't ODP uh, and quite as official as it is now. We had zone teams. Um, so to begin my national team career, I competed with my zone team and there was a whole weekend long um, tournament that happened. And you'd play, play with your zone team. And then from there, if they liked you, they'd pick you on to a national selection mm -hmm. team. Um, and you'd compete with that team during the weekend. Um, and so you kind of flip flop back and forth all the way till the culmination of the weekend where they chose a selection team. And that was the first time I got chosen for the youth national team. Can't quite remember 2005 or 2006, but, um, so that was my first experience, which was really awesome actually, because we got to do some traveling. I remember a tournament in Canada was my first national national team tournament with the youth team. So that was pretty exciting. Um, from there, I continued to stay in the pipeline, but um, uh, kind of unfortunate for me personally was that um, they decided to change the years of the junior team. So they flopped them two years below me and then flopped them two years ahead of me. So all of international water polo, my age group lost the opportunity to play on the junior team, um, but I stuck with it and got asked to play on a few senior B tournaments. Um, I went to college, which was amazing for my development as a player and as a person, as a teammate. But um, 2011 was the first time that um, I had to stop out of school and Adam asked me to take a year off and train full time with the senior team. Um, looking forward to my first Olympic Games. So, yeah, it's been a long road since. And where did you end up? Uh, you ended up in college. Uh, talk about your college experience uh, playing and uh, how that went for you. Sure. Uh, I played at Stanford University. I graduated in 2013. Um, my total career was five years because I played three and then took a leave of absence my senior year and went back after the 2012 games to finish. Um, it was an unbelievable experience. You know, I think college anywhere is, but Stanford was unique in that um, I shared this with Jimmy and his club girls the other day, but um, while I was being recruited, I sat down with the head coach, John Tanner, and he said, um, you know, where do you want your water polo career to take you and what do you want out of this? And I can remember at that point committing to um, my dream of being an Olympian and just what they had to offer me and how much support they gave me on that road to achieving my dreams uh, was probably one of the the biggest highlights of of that college career so and then uh so at that point 2013 you said graduate 2013 correct so you had already uh won a gold medal in 2012 and then uh what was your focus then obviously you're out of school at this point uh were you exclusively training then for the rio games um you know uh, uh, <laughs> Interesting question. I think four years out, it's hard to um, be as committed as you are in a year leading up to the Olympic Games. So um, exclusively training, I would say no. But um, after 2012, I finished my senior year of college. Um, and then that next summer, played with the national team and decided to go abroad and play water polo. So I spent uh, fall of 2013 to 2014 in Spain playing water polo professionally so that was just a great opportunity to learn more about myself away from a team it was my first time being an individual athlete in a team space where I had to figure out what worked best for me as opposed to just listening and following the coach's direction so um, learned a ton about myself while I was playing in Spain and I learned a ton about international water polo because it's constantly changing and um, they, they do a lot of different things over there in Europe. So um, I played professional water polo for a year, and then I traveled some um, and competed with a professional team without living in Spain. Uh, and then, then it was full-time training for 2016, so. 
And which team were you, uh, which club were you training with in uh, Spain? I was with, um, I was with Sabade in, in Sabade, Spain. It's about 45 minutes outside of Barcelona. And were you fluent at that point in Spanish? Uh -huh. Or did you just have your, your California Spanish going to, to get no, you by out there? You know, it's, it's really interesting. I don't have much California Spanish, but I have enough that I can understand. And if I need something, I could get it. But the part of Spain I was living in um, was Catalonia. So they spoke Catalan. And uh, in that area, they're very um, proud of their heritage. So they, I don't know, they don't really like Spanish speakers. And then I was speaking this like broken, weird, not really Spanish anyway. And so I kind of gave up at one point and I just, I had a roommate who could speak English and she just translated everything for me. So <laughs> Yeah. Did you during that time when you guys were when you were playing over there? Um, if you if you don't mind sharing us sharing a little bit of it with us the uh, um, the the club system, how you guys did, where you finished uh, in that, sure. and how that was. Yeah, sure. Uh, the club system it's unique over there. It's very different. I, I think well, unique to us, but uh, very typical in Europe. Um, but they have a pipeline within their club system, so similar to our programs except for you can go all the way up to professional water polo so they had their juvenile teams they had their youth teams um and then they they paid their um their senior teams or their professional athletes um which was really cool and so it's also attached to like uh, i'm not sure what it would be like in the midwest but if you can imagine like a ymca or something like that it's attached to a club like that. So there's also recreational fitness. There, there can be other sports that are involved, some teams and stuff like that. So um, it's really, it's really, really cool because the whole city is proud of these club teams and wherever they are. Um, so that makes it a totally different experience than a club team, even in Southern California, but I'm sure anywhere else. Um, so yeah, that's what, it, it was cool. It was really cool because we, we ate at a club. Everyone kind of knew who we were. Um, and it was a, it was a well-known club. We ended up winning Champions League um, as well as the Spanish League the year I was there. So that was a big deal for them. And I was kind of, I, I participated and I made an impact on the team for sure. But um, it was just really cool to see how proud they were of that. Whereas, um, I don't know, in Southern California, you don't feel that excitement for winning those, those things quite as much. So and then, so you're you're building this camaraderie with the team, but then you you mentioned with the club itself, um, you know, the town and the people in the club rallying around you guys. So were you guys out supporting uh, the, the other sports and uh, when from the club as well? And how did that work? Uh, like? Yeah, I think I think some. Um, we mostly supported other water polo. You know, we did a lot of community is very small, so we watched all, all the men's teams games. Um, traveled with them and um, a lot of double headers so that's fun but then they also especially um, being tied to the um, national team in Spain because um, we had a lot of girls in our program so we went out and supported the other water polo clubs less less other sports than just water polo so yeah, yeah. and then so I guess uh, so several of these athletes who are your your teammates in Spain you're turning around and probably competing against uh, next yeah. couple of years in different, how was that? It's a unique experience, definitely, because, you know, you're in a foreign country and you're uncomfortable. And for me, I didn't know the language. And so it was awesome to come to that um, environment and have those national team athletes totally understand it and take me in. I met their families. I, you know, we just, we became really good friends. Yeah, and then you turn around in that summer, it's the, um, I don't care who you are, I'm going to kick your butt anyway mentality. So, uh -huh. you know, on, on the deck, off the deck are two different things. But I mean, besides the emotional and personal relationship part of that, um, playing in Europe, our, our team, our national team grows from that because, you know, you can study other athletes, you can learn new things, learn new styles of play. And we have girls that are playing all over the world. So they're able to bring that knowledge back to the senior team and say, you know, I, I played with this girl on the Spanish team. She's the best for them. And this is what she does every single day. And we're able to learn about other athletes and other systems of play that definitely benefit us as a national team. 
So to, to, are there limits on the number of athletes from outside of Spain that, the, that their club was allowed to bring on to their team? So it's different. Um, there's a Spanish league or a Greek league or um, a Hungarian league, or there's also Champions League, which is countries, the best teams from those countries enter into it. So the for the Champions League, it's only two foreigners. Each team is allowed. Um, and that could be from the U.S. or from anywhere. It's, it's just two foreigners. But I think each country league has their own limitations. So it might be three or four, just depending on the year and what they decide to do. And were you the only American on your team? I was the only American on my team. Yeah, uh, there was a Hungarian on my team also who played for the Hungarian national team. And um, she was my roommate and my translator and my buffer and all, all good things. So. Yeah. And then um, did your family ever get to go over and watch you play when you come yeah. watch you play live? Yeah. I got really lucky that um, my sisters came over more for vacation than to actually <laughs> me play uh, but I have an older sister and I have a younger sister and they were both um, able to spend a week with me over in Spain and then um, for our Champions League so the biggest part of the whole season for us my dad was able to come out and um, he watched me for a weekend and then we took off and vacationed in France for a little bit so yeah oh, really that's, cool experience. that's really cool and yeah. then uh, is that something that I mean you think of an athlete you know in a major sport having an agent set that up is that something that you have to do on your own or do you go through Adam to set that up or how does that work for uh, um, a national team athlete in your position yeah a national athlete in my position um I think it's changed actually in more recent years um because more athletes on my team are utilizing agents um and I just the more experience you have negotiating a deal like that, the, the better it is. So it's not a, it's a good thing to use an agent. Um, when I went through it, Adam helped me. Um, he found the best team in Spain. He contacted the coach and he set it all up for me. Um, but it's also an opportunity for um, especially girls coming out of college that aren't done playing, but there isn't much competitive water polo in the state. So I, I know a lot of girls go over and they, you know, you just, you find a coach on Facebook or Instagram or word of mouth, you send them an email and they're able to, to set up deals that way. So there's really a, a range for how to get to a professional league in Europe. Um, I wouldn't have gone if Adam wasn't um, pushing me to or setting it up for me. Um, yeah. So I'm grateful for him for that. But um, yeah, so you can do it on your own or utilizing an agent, especially for a more elite athlete, you're going to get a better deal because they do have money over there to support their athletes. Okay. Awesome. Um, and then I guess right now, so what's, what are you, what's going on with you right now? I know you were, you've been coaching, right? Yeah, I spent a few years coaching, uh, re contemplating retirement after 2016. I joined um, the UCI staff. Um, and as a volunteer assistant, and then, sorry, this dog is jumping up in front with us, <laughs> uh, as a volunteer assistant, and then I spent a whole year as, um, since I hired a second assistant for women's water polo, or water polo in general, um, so that was really cool. I also coached a youth group, 14 under girls, which um, was really fun, and I think those two experiences were kind of what made me realize um, I'm not done loving the sport yet, and I still have the ability to play at this high level. And so, um, you know, I kept competing with the team, and here I am. Um, I got my teaching credential last year. So I actually kind of took a hiatus from playing and just worked out life fitness on my own, um, but wasn't able to play much water polo last year. Um, and now I'm just waiting for information. <laughs> so there's, there's not a lot of coaching going on right now. I'm looking at some opportunities, but in a full-time training year, it's, it's really, really hard for our schedule to do anything besides play water polo. Um, but this coming year, it's just going to be, I mean, I'm sure you guys are both um, wondering how everything's going to play out. There aren't any coaching opportunities right now. Um, I can't move on to the next thing because we're, we're waiting to find out what's going to happen. So yeah, in limbo right now, but definitely spent some time coaching and totally loved it. And you were doing 14 U girls at SoCal, correct? Yes, that was my Okay. Year. 
<laughs> how did you uh take them to national jos and and such Were you yeah i got to that? go to jos yeah with them one time um up at stanford so that was that was really fun yeah that's oh, it's, a, uh, it's an awesome group awesome yeah i think uh both jimmy and i would have uh, we saw them, but Jimmy and I, Jimmy had his club down at an uh, international tournament that Michael Goldenberg runs down in Florida, and uh -huh. both the SoCal, the Ed was down there with the group down there, so uh, uh, yeah. he had the, I think the 16 girls were, or maybe even been the co and then the co-ed boys were down there too, so. Yeah. Uh, so, so, great club, fantastic club, so it's great, great to yeah. be a part of that, so. Yeah. And those 14 U girls, they were fierce. <laughs> they were, <laughs> uh, to say the least, they were, they were intense. And uh, yeah. it made sense. They had a, an awesome coach. Yeah. yeah. You know, I got, it, it's funny because I got pretty lucky. Um, so Ed, you guys know him, but Ed, Ed kind of runs the whole show. He does everything. So I got lucky to fall into that position through connections because he handled everything. And I just got to coach the girls. And I happened to get this group of 14 other girls that was just as competitive as I was. And I was like, oh, this is going to be fun. So yeah, they were intense and they got, they got the, they got the real athlete side of me softened up a little bit more towards the end of that experience, just because I realized that not everybody is that competitive. And, um, but that first group of girls I got was, they were into it. So it was fun. That's awesome. And how did you kind of grow that competitive spirit among the team? um as you coach them I think I I had a unique position being that I was still playing um because I can remember a lot of conversations with them just being like oh this is hard or oh uh, I don't want to or stuff like that and I you know I I could relate to them because I was like you picked the hardest sport in the world you know water polo is tough in every step of the way and everything that we do it's tough um, and I think because I was able to connect to them on that level, like if I can still do it, you can still do it um, kind of thing that they really just fed off of my competitive spirit. So that was, it was cool. That's awesome. And uh, we, you and I have spoken about this before, uh, but what are some of the things that you think are most important for a 14U athlete to sort of have mastered before they get to that 18U level? Yeah. Um, I think especially – at 14 years coming into 14 unders you hope that you have some fundamentals but I know that in a lot of places that's the, the starting point for people um and so if you don't I think the fundamental skills are obviously focusing on your egg beater and making sure that that's strong but your body position I think is more important than your egg beater and that being um understanding like that your core is kind of what powers a lot of your movements um, and if you can combine those two, your base egg beater with um, your core, your over the hips movements, your vertical to horizontal egg beater, um, and then just understanding that um, in most scenarios, your body should be in a horizontal, you know, even on offense, if you're waiting to drive or move or drop your hips, like you want to be in a horizontal position because it, it gives us um, just the best body position to make the next move. And I, I think that that's a something that's under taught at the 14 under level, but is definitely crucial to moving up and being able to have those skills and develop more when you move forward. And then the same question with an 18 and under player who's hoping to play in college, um, ha you having seen all sorts of players around the world, what have you noticed is an absolute must have uh, going into, into someone's collegiate career? Yeah, I, I, I think I know that your question is about your your skills or your body position, but I think the moving from a, a club level and each and under level into a collegiate sport, if it's something that you're committed to, the best skill that you can have is to be coachable. Because if you're moving up to that next level, it, it means that a coach saw potential in you and it means that they, they want to give you more information. They want to help you build um, and grow. And I think a lot of athletes at that age, um, whether it be a personality trait, whether it just be kind of the age and what they're doing with their friends, or I don't know what the exact reason, but you tend to get kind of locked in your way and pretty resistant to change. And I found that to be the hardest thing when coaching a collegiate group was just that um, 
not that they thought they knew everything, but they thought they knew something. And so it was much harder to teach them. And I think that skill above anything else is, is just really important just to be coachable and learn how to listen to your coaches and try to change. And then also just be a student of the game and take that information into your own game. That is super crucial. I, I love that that was your answer uh, because I think <laughs> it does get lost in translation um, across all, all age levels, but especially at that college, um, college college experience. So I'm glad you said that. Um, and uh, with coaching in mind, you also have done a lot of things with holiday camp over the years. Um, how how is that experience for you having the chance to directly affect 120 or some girls uh, year in, year out? Um, what is that experience like for you? Yeah. Um, the holiday camp is totally special to me. And every time I go, it's selfish because I get way more out of it than the girls do. Um, I, I just love it. I, I It's this the small group makes it even more intimate and I am I, 120 girls you say that but it doesn't feel like 120 girls because when you're in that environment you're able to talk to each one of them um see their personalities come out as they're interacting and that that for me is what's most fun but I also know that being in that environment being at the Olympic Training Center with the rings around with pictures um it, it just feels a little bit more intense and I think that kind of it makes the experience so that I can give them some of my Olympic journey um, and share with them, you know, all the parts and they're able to understand it a little bit better because of the intensity of the environment. And I think that's why that camp is, is so special. So, yeah, but it's totally selfish every time I go, I have, you know, I stand up there and I'm able to talk to the girls and I just, I just realize how, how much the sport means to me. Absolutely. And uh, sports, as we all know, directly linked to, to life and have a lot of lessons within it. Are there any lessons uh, within the sport that you think directly um, link to life um, or things that you like as you're coaching, you're like trying to really convey these values or what have you to your players? Hmm. Of course there are. Let me think which ones. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, no, I, you know, when you first asked that question, I, I think it's interesting because um, what what sports have done for me it, from a coaching standpoint, but from an athlete standpoint all around is just helped me understand myself better. And that's kind of the first thing that I think of when you say that is, you know, I learned how to control my emotions through the sport. I learned how to curb my competitive um, attitude. Through, I learned how to do so many things through the sport. Um, and that's what I take away from my life. And I think that that's the one thing that I try and coach when I'm with my 14 under girls is just, you know, how, how wonderful and how amazing all of these qualities that you have are, but how do they fit within a team and how can you make them work to your advantage moving forward? Um, and I, I think that's really cool getting to work with youth groups. individual level but with those youth groups I'm really able to like have those discussions and talk about what it means to grow and um, choose values that are meaningful to them um, so that's awesome um, switching to kind of the X's and O's do you have any like go-to favorite shooting drills that you always run in practice or that the kids like absolutely love oh man yeah I have one I think that, well, we do a couple of different things, but there's one that the girls love and it's really hard. So it's really good, but we make like a gauntlet. So we'll put a row of girls on the right, a row of girls on the left, and you have to walk through the gauntlet in, you know, triple threat position or whatever you guys call it, good body position. Um, and then once, as you're going through the gauntlet, all the girls are pushing your hips, they're pushing your shoulders or, um, whatever trying to knock you off balance so when you get through then you're able to take your time take a few fakes and go for a shot and it's I mean it's awesome for body position it's awesome for leg strength and the girls just have a blast pushing each other around and then they just get to shoot the ball so that's one of our favorites that's awesome I'm absolutely stealing that one <laughs> <laughs> um and then going to the x's and o's uh 
Team USA is absolutely dominant. I mean, I was re-watching some of the 2016 Olympic Games, uh, Spain and Italy specifically, and it, it, it's almost like you guys know what you're going to run, and you almost, like, so to speak, run the same idea with every game. Obviously, there's some tweaks and revisions here and there, but the other teams, they know what you're going to do, but for some reason, they still can't like, beat it. And so what do you think is, and you're smirking right now, but what, what are, uh, what do you think is one of the reasons to your team's success? Uh, we're just students of the game, to be honest. I mean, uh, everything you said is true. For every game I've played in, every important game I've played in on this team, we're overprepared. We study other teams. We know um, all of their players' tendencies. We know their team tendencies. We, you know, our coach knows their coach tendencies. Um, this, this group, this, the culture that we have created is, um, it's un unlike any other, but one of the marks is how prepared we want to be when we get to international competition. And I just think that everybody on our team takes pride in, um, in knowing that information, but more importantly, knowing that information about ourselves. So, um, you know, we spend time talking about our own tendencies, where we like the ball, how, how we want um, this pick to be run, how we want these things to be run, and we do it tirelessly so that we've studied our team more than we've studied other teams. And I think that, that that's what makes it so fluid when we get into a game is we've just stopped thinking because we've done all the work ahead of time. It's really cool how you're not – obviously, you do study the other teams and you focus on what they do, but – you're almost prioritizing yourselves and trying to figure out what your traits are and moving forward from there. Um, I don't think most people would have pegged that as one of the keys to your team's success. So that's really interesting to hear. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, it's I fun. I, I think it's important to just, um, I have a different perspective than most of my teammates, but um, you know, I, I tend not to think about the other team because I know that I've done the work and I'm going to be able to apply that to anybody's game. My other, my teammates are better at, um, at you know, matchups and stuff like that. But it, it is really important, and especially, um, especially in the youth level, being able to identify your strengths and weaknesses as an athlete, um, you can take that to any game. So, yeah. Is there any game specifically, and it might be many, but uh, from the start of your career to now, where this game or this moment really stands out to you because it was just really intense or, or what have you? Can you hear me? <laughs> yeah, there's a few. Uh, yeah, I can hear you. Oh, sorry, you're, you're, you're frozen there for a second. Sorry about that. Oh, that's all right. Um, few moments of intensity are are you asking intensity in terms of sport personal intensity i guess like all the above uh, <laughs> that's a tough question just because moments stand out to me for a reason yeah let's circle back to that one Okay, sounds good. Sorry, you're you're cutting in and out a little bit. It's it's a little a little hard to hear. Um, can can you hear me? Okay. Here's a. I can yeah, hear you. Yeah. Touch. Okay. Miguel, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, I'll, I I got one more for you, Melissa. I know you guys are traveling. Where where are you guys headed, by the way? Um, my parents are in the Bay Area, so we're going. Oh, okay. Six, yeah, six hours from us. <laughs> nice. Um, the, the question I have uh, for you, uh, actually, and this can be either high school, club, uh, international competition, national team, whatever, who is the one girl that pushed you the hardest that you always competed against? Um, it could be a teammate, but I, I think back to like when I was playing collegiately and my best friend was my roommate, who was also a lefty and I always had to guard him and to the point that we lived together, but I would walk home. I didn't want to ride home with him. The practices were so intense <laughs> and so yes. tough, um, but we were in each other's weddings, et cetera. But, you know, I think back to him, he made me a better player, but 
you know, if yeah. you have, is there somebody like, and I don't want to throw you under the bus, but if there's like a, no. somebody out there that like, okay, this girl, she just pushed me so hard. And I always wanted to beat her, whether it was a swim set or match up or something like that. It's funny the way that you phrased the question, because I can think of a few people that are that for me physically, but I, I don't know. For me, the physical part of the game has always kind of been second to um, the mental and emotional part of the game because that was the toughest barriers for me to overcome. Um, and so my person is not somebody that I competed directly against position wise or in the water, but Brenda Villa, who is uh, monumental in everybody's game, but um, sh she's got it. She's got a hard personality and she was tough. So coming into the 2012 team as a, as a rookie or um, a newcomer, and I also have a very tough personality. I don't know if it's coming across in this call at all, but um, my best qualities are how stubborn I am, how competitive I am. And I know these things about myself, so I'm able to use them to my advantage, but those were also her best qualities. And um, she just pushed me to kind of think, think beyond myself and think beyond um, what I was experiencing, especially because she had already been through so much. Um, and yeah, she really changed the game for me. So uh, we didn't compete one-on-one -on -one in a game and I have some of those people too, but um, it, it was everything else outside of the water. And her, I mean, she's brilliant when you talk to her about water polo, just brilliant. She understands the game. She remembers things. She sees things other people can't. Um, and so really mentally and emotionally, she, she pushed me to be a better player, better person. Thank you. That's awesome. Brenda yeah. is awesome. <laughs> um, what are, this might be a, a tough one also, but what is the best piece of advice you've gotten from a coach? I don't listen to my coaches. Didn't I already tell you that? <laughs> um, you know, I can think about, I think about a few moments that I can pinpoint as being um, influential in my career and everything was about commitment um, and talking to my coaches, uh, just le learning how to commit um, whether it be to a team, whether it be to a dream, or whether it be to something small, like getting better on a skill. Um, yeah, learning, learning how to commit. So I don't have, but I remember um, just, just trying to understand like, okay, I think I'm doing it, but I'm not doing enough. So how do I do more? How do I be more committed, more disciplined um, to those things? And yeah, so those are really powerful words from, from a couple of coaches I can think of. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, Melissa, thank you so much for your time. We, we really, really appreciate it. Um, we're, we're excited for um, you and for Team USA to compete in 2021, and we wish you guys the absolute best of luck. Um, and, well, we, we know it's going to go really well. So, again, best of luck, and thank you again for your time. Yeah, thank you so much. This was fun. Thank you. And enjoy your weekend with Father's Day weekend, I guess. You're heading back home for us. So enjoy that. Yeah. So, okay, cool. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Take Thanks. care. All right. Talk to you guys later. See ya. Yeah.